Um, but one of the things that makes spider spider webs quite interesting is that if you look at them, they're actually also some of the most high aspect ratio uh, natural structures that you see anywhere. Um, you know, these are things that um, have have threads that are microns uh, microns wide, but then are suspended over over really centimeter scales and sometimes even meter scales. There are some like brown spider species that that make these webs over meters with with little strings that are microns in size. Maybe something that um, I started to appreciate um, really much later in my career is, is is looking at that and saying, you know, if we made that in a in a in a foundry, that would actually be quite impressive to make something like that that's freestanding and that can take the wind and you know can take all these really big forces like a big prey you know falling onto it and not breaking which makes it very similar to these high aspect ratio structures you make in silicon nitride um, and this high stress is a really big part of that you know in the material aspect because if you have some kind of you know floppy material uh, you're not going to make very high aspect ratio structures because they won't be nice and taut and you know be able to make them straight on a microchip or a, or a silicon wafer. There is a really intimate connection between the material that you use, the, the, the architecture, the structure, and the design. In this podcast, I'm sharing my passion and curiosity for soft robotics, where we share inspiring stories about the work we do and how we can push the limit. I am Mara Dwini, and this is Soft Robotics Podcast. Support for this show comes from Science Robotics Journal. I really find science robotics to be a great resource for reliable and tangible research where we can really push the limit of the science we do in robotics. Great way to stay up to date with the published article is checking out the released monthly issue. All the links will be included in each episode description. We will also happen to have a regular conversation on the most published science robotic articles where also you can contribute with your question and thoughts about the research. Thanks, Science Robotics, for sponsoring Soft Robotics Podcast. So I found your work in, in designing sensor using web, spider webs is very interesting. And if you can tell us more before what actually you're working on, what kind of problem or, or grand question you're trying to do with your group? Yeah, so um, what you find, uh, at least one of the things that I've been quite fascinated with, is that you find that there's a lot of these really um, deep problems about um, quantum mechanics and also even about just sensing in general that are quite related to to just very basic ideas of isolating objects from the surrounding environments. So if you want to talk about, for instance, looking at... So one of the things that's kind of a big uh, research question right now is um, you know, you have the laws of quantum mechanics, uh, and there's all these really interesting phenomena like entanglement and tunneling and uh, superpositions, and you see this at the scale of atoms, but uh, can you see this at the scale of really large objects, and I mean objects that have billions of atoms, um, and so no one really knows whether quantum mechanics has a size limit. Uh, one, of the, one of the reasons that it's really difficult is that uh, when you have something that's very large, it's also really well connected to the outside environment. So it's in, a, in a sense, uh, this, there's this noise that's really um, everywhere, right? In our everyday lives, there's a lot of vibrational noise. It's hot, in a, in a sense, for quantum mechanics to exist. Uh, to, so, so a lot of this noise essentially hides a lot of this quantum behavior in these big objects. So one of the questions is, can we isolate these big objects from this outside environment? Uh, because that is something that will hide that quantum behavior. Um, and so what you find is that that's also a, a fundamental question for sensors. Because uh, if you want to sense something, you want to sense these really small forces. And there you also want to be able to isolate uh, uh, away 
your sensor from this outside noisy environment. So it's a really interesting thing because it seems like vibration isolation is something that, you know, you see it in cars, you see it, in, and, and it's such a, it seems like such a simple concept, but it's something that's now really underlying a lot of the big physics questions we have and a lot of the big, um, you know, sensor questions that we have. So maybe before going to the sensing bar, can you tell me more about the quantum behavior? Can you break it down more in a sense? What it actually is? What are the challenges here of the behavior, quantum behavior? So I guess one way I would think about it is, for instance, uh, you can think about a, a, a swing, right? And if I were to swing, they had a swing and, and you wanted to cool it in a way, cooling it being to dampen its motion. Uh, usually we think about atoms and something being hot. We think about all the atoms kind of jiggling around. And if we cool it, we kind of uh, dampen down that motion so that they're not jiggling around so much. Um, now, if I think about a swing, you can think about that in a similar way where you have some a swing swinging back and forth. And what you could do is try to cool it, cool it in a way of dampening its motion. So when I'm on a swing, I can usually push it at the right moment and put more energy into it and make someone go higher. Um, but I could also do the opposite thing and I could also push it in a way to dampen its motion and kind of uh, make its motion smaller and smaller and smaller. And so that's something that we try to do essentially with light, where we essentially try to uh, make its motion such, in such a way that we can start to even count its motion in terms of single quanta of, of vibrations. Um, and so once you get to that regime, you start to see these really interesting quantum effects in these large objects once you can start to cool them. But you can't cool it that far if there's always energy pouring in from the outside, from the outside environment. So when you're making this kind of vibrating object, you also have to make sure that, that there is some really good isolation from this outside environment. Um, and that's something that, uh, that we've been working on in this uh, latest publication. I want to ask you, what makes a good sensor design? Firstly, what makes a good sensor design? So one of, the, one of the things that we tackle and one of the big things that basically all sensors really try to uh, go for is being able to, to get this good isolation from outside environments. Because if I, want to, if I want to measure these very small forces or very small accelerations or small pressures, uh, you want to make sure that what you're reading is really that small pressure force or acceleration that, that you want to measure and not some, you know, jittering from the outside. Uh, so, so this is one of the things that, that, that is one of the kind of the underlying uh, figure of merits that a lot of sensors look for, which is called the quality factor uh, of, of a sensor. Um, so, so this is one of the things. And the other thing is that uh, you want, you want uh, sensors that are small. You want sensors that, are, that have a very small footprint uh, so that you can fit them in, in small spaces, so you can make many of them, so you can really parallelize them on a microchip. So it's the size of it and also the isolation that you can get. And those two things don't necessarily go hand in hand um, because if you have something that is really small, it means that you don't have a lot of space to engineer this, this vibration isolation from the outside environment. Um, and the other, and I think another big aspect, which is something that we really worked on is, uh, that they work well at room temperature. And that's really one of the big, uh, uh, I would say, um, uh, figures of merit when you're talking about sensors, because that's something that that allows it to work in really any, any kind of environment. You don't need to get uh, really specialized equipment to cool it down and put it in a very cold fridge to, to essentially uh, you know, um, isolate it from this, from, from this uh, outside environment. Mm -hmm. Great. So I'm curious to ask you first step maybe in the design of the sensor, the list of requirements. You have the vibration, you want to isolate from vibration or signal to noise ratio, response time. There are many things here to consider. What's the first step to design the sensor? Do you look for the material part? And of course, the interesting part, I would like to discuss more about the web uh, inspired by spider, the web design. But first, this design is space when you have this characteristic or this objective you want to reach in the design. How we approach that? What does the technique just use to design the sensor to achieve that goal? 
So you mean essentially like what? How do we decide what kind of material we use for it? What kind of platform we use for it? Out of all the platforms that exist. Yeah, and if you're looking for that, the goal like response time, signal to noise ratio, vibration. Do you think each objective would significantly change the way you think about the design, or and that's why what's the first step for you? What is the first thing is so yeah so important to you in the design consideration? Yeah, so. Um, for us, for us, it was it was trying to make the sensor. Uh, this quality factor is really is really something that you'll see in a lot of different uh, research groups. People, a lot of people going for it because you kind of see it universally popping out in a lot of the performance uh, factors that that people that people look at. Um, so that was kind of one of the things we looked at, and and if we looked at, for instance, the material uh, system. Um, if you look at kind of all of the state of the art uh, room temperature uh, sensors, uh, what you find is that many of them are actually made with uh, a particular uh, kind of material, which is a thin film material, which is highly stressed. Um, and that is something that that is actually quite unique to the kind of uh, sensors that that compared to other sensors that are made from silicon, for instance. Silicon you won't find in a really highly stressed Material, uh, 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 material or thin film way, even though it's a very popular material, um, it's not in a high stress form. So one of the things that we we've been looking at is, for instance, silicon nitride, which comes out in a in a which can be deposited in a very high stress, um, a thin film, and the reason for that is that is that it's uh, deposited at very high temperatures, um, making uh, making it uh, have these kind of high stresses. Um, just by the fact that you're, you're depositing one film on top of a silicon wafer and then the thermal expansion coefficient differences of them give you these really high stresses. Um, one of the things is that normally people don't, for, for the longest time actually, if you look at a lot of the literature, people have actually usually wanted to remove this high stress from, from, from these films because it actually makes them very difficult to work with. It means that things will break, things will snap, things will rip. Uh, and that's one of the things that I've actually been looking at over the last decade is is how do we actually look at these high stress films and and instead of kind of trying to take away the stress, why don't we try to actually use it and try to manipulate it and ma manufacture it in a way that's easy uh, so that we can actually do something with it? Because what you actually find is that, for instance, these quality factors or the ability to isolate from these outside environments is actually highly tied to how um, how much of a high stress you can put into these films. Yes, for the part when you say that stress is high stresses and it's break easily. So how do you look for stresses as something maybe interesting and not to get rid of and try to manipulate it as you mentioned in the last part? Can you tell more about that? How we did it or you thought about that? Yeah, so so what I noticed at least, so a lot of this research actually um, started in my uh, PhD at Caltech um, where where I was really starting to, you know, they kind of gave me this project where they were saying, you know, we have these high stress films, we want to make devices out of them, but it seems to be really difficult. And actually, one of the things that I really focused on was the manufacturing uh, uh, aspects of it, which are really tied to how you design it. Um, because what you find is that um, by thinking about the way in which you make it, you can act, this, this actually ends up being one of the big bottlenecks for a lot of quantum technologies that you see. So, you know, there's a lot of things about, you know, uh, when you look at a lot of quantum technologies, you actually find that one of the big bottlenecks is, is actually the fabrication of, of, the, of the materials and how you fabricate it. And so in this instance, for these room temperature uh, uh, quantum technologies um, or room temperature, you know, uh, sensors, you find that these high stress films are actually really advantageous uh, for 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 uh, uh, for a lot of the, the 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 key parameters that you need for your experiments. And so, one of the things that I started looking at is how do we fabricate these things without putting any types of forces on them when we manufacture them. Uh, so, when you manufacture them, usually uh, your chip uh, is going to feel a lot of different forces. It's going to feel the force of you putting it in and out of a liquid because you're cleaning it, let's say, because you want to put it into your experiment. Um, it, um, 
it, it's going to feel the force of you moving it from from uh, one one uh, location to another. It's going to have some effects from how much dust falls on it. Um, so it's really quite sensitive in that sense. And especially when you're working with these high stress films, what you find is that they're incredibly sensitive to to how they are manipulated during the manufacturing process. Mm -hmm. Maybe th maybe argument here. Why did you consider, for example, it seems challenging. Do you think there's other options beyond high stress films here to, yeah, to avoid that? You already tried to to do that, but I'm curious. If there's other options. Yeah, and and th there are other options. Um, and the and I guess what we went with was one of the more classical. More, more widely used high stress films because uh, I think one of the main uh, aims for, for our research was that this could be something that could be widely adopted by, by many researchers. So we didn't want to go for some very specific material that you know only our lab grows, but something that is really widely grown by many, many labs. And so that was actually one of the things we went for in our design was making it such that it was very easy to make, very simple design, and that it had um, um, sizes that could be done very easily by a lot of labs, uh, rather than it being you know super small and super specific and very difficult to make kind of kind of devices. So yeah, I, I was asking you about the story behind the design, selecting spider web and the design. If you can tell us more about the role of architecture, we now discussed the material and the manufacturing and the challenges, but. The architecture and why did you select the spider web? Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. Um, so, so, so the way that this research actually started was that um, uh, I actually started to collaborate with uh, um, another professor at the TU Delft. Uh, his name is Miguel Bessa, uh, and so he's a machine learning uh, al uh, machine learning expert. And so what we had, uh, what we had gotten is a grant together so that we could um, essentially try to put together our expertise. So my expertise being nanotechnology, his expertise being machine learning. And we were thinking, okay, so let's sit down and try to make a new type of sensor using the platforms that I've been using. So I know that silicon nitride is, if you look at kind of the state of the art of all the room temperature optomechanical sensors, they've all essentially been been made from silicon nitride high stress silicon nitride and that's that's kind of been a u ubiquitous kind of thing that you see throughout the literature um, it's just because it's it's kind of like i said before it's it's a material that that is widely used it's really well known it's been manufactured for many decades um, and so and so what i was thinking was okay so we have the material platform we know how the loss you know how the losses happen in it. How by uh, how how to isolate more or less. So there's been a lot of research on this. Um, so why don't we try to use machine learning and put it together with this platform and try to make a new design. Um, and so and so one of the things that that I would say is very special about the type of devices that people make out of these high stress silicon nitride films that make it different from maybe a lot of kind of nanotechnology or nanostructures is that you make these very high aspect ratio structures. These are things that are, you know, nanometers thin, but millimeters in, in size. So, so you really have these kind of high aspect ratio suspended membrane kind of structures. Um, and so when I talked with uh, my collaborator, Miguel Bessa, um, we were trying to basically think about how do we best put together this machine learning algorithm that he's been that he's been developing with the kind of structures that I'm making. And the very interesting thing was that um, the type of uh, machine learning, uh, the type of machine learning algorithms that he's been developing are actually ones uh, that are that are kind of in the realm of of data driven uh, machine learning. And and one of the things that I think makes it kind of unique uh, from from a lot of the data data driven machine learning that you hear about is usually when you think about for instance uh, for instance deep learning you think about a whole you know encyclopedia a whole mess of data that's really going into this machine learning and here what he was looking at is actually more uh, uh, data scarce machine learning so machine learning that could actually come up with with designs with very very little data 
And so, so one question is, how does that line up to the nanotechnology we're doing? Well, the thing is that with these high aspect ratio structures, they're actually not so easy to simulate because they're really large structures. They really require a lot of simulation space. So each one, in a way, is, is very difficult to, to simulate, and that makes it a data-scarce problem because we can't just sit there and, you know, uh, um, uh, um, simulate, you know, all different types of designs as much as we want. Each one takes about 30 minutes. Uh, so that makes it so that we really need to be able to make a few few designs and in that few designs train the machine learning to already make a very optimal design. So that's where these th we started think, thinking, okay, th these two things can actually be merged together pretty well. Now for the base design, um, we, started, we started looking uh, first at just uh, the designs that are already kind of the state-of-the-art designs. So we started putting in, you know, the, 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 the designs that we had seen in a lot of, you know, nature papers and these kind of things just to see, could it improve it more? And it could somewhat, um, but it wasn't giving us anything really interesting because we were kind of, we were kind of uh, limiting it to this, to this design and the way that it worked. Um, and so one of the things we started thinking about was, well, okay, so, you know, why don't we think outside of this? And we started looking at kind of nature, right? So if you look at nature and you look at spider webs, you know, spider webs are, are really this vibrational sensor that's been optimized in nature over millions of years. It's been just optimized relentlessly over millions of years. And, and we don't really know how it works, right? Like if I look at a spider web, it's really difficult. It's a very complex system. And it probably has a lot of mechanisms in which we don't know how, to, how it works. So that's not something where we're going to try to figure out how millions of, you know, millions of years of evolution works. Um, so, so what we thought is, why don't we just give it a base model of a, of a spider web, put this into the machine learning algorithm, and then see if it can figure out something special about this design, just, just to see how the, how, what, it, what it would come up with. And we let it, you know, we kind of did something that looked more or less like a like a Halloween version of a of a spider web, you know, it has its radial lines. It has some um, lateral lines that are connecting those radial lines. And we said, pick how many radial lines you want, how many lateral lines you want, and just and then we said, but now use don't use spider silk. Instead, use the silicon nitride, the high stress silicon nitride that we use. And now and now imagine that it's in a high vacuum system. So there's no air damping. So now the major loss is the bending in the material. And essentially from there, can you try to optimize for a sensor? And in that sense, can you optimize for a quality factor? So that's, so that's essentially how we went about it. Um, and what's interesting is that, you know, we kind of, if, if, if you ask me, I, I honestly thought that it was going to give some very complex weird geometry that I would have, you know, never thought about. But what it did was actually something way more interesting is that it actually minimized the, the number of, uh, of, of connections to basically a bare minimum. It had, it basically used six strings to make a web. So it took, I think it only, of the radial lines, it only had two of them that are just crossed and it basically connected those. And then what it did was it instead Usually we think of, um, when, we, when we think about a, a, a sensor or membrane resonator, if you looked at all the literature, what they usually do is they bend in and out of plane in the middle, and then they kind of dissipate as you go away. And th what people try to do is um, engineer how, to, um, how this thing bends from the center where it bends the most all the way to the edge. And the machine learning algorithm actually did something very different which is it said, well, I, instead of trying to make the center go up and down like you normally would in a sensor, why don't we have the, the vibration go around the lateral uh, um, um, tethers and just go basically go around the edge. So instead of trying to avoid the edge or trying to design the way that this thing vibrates towards the edge, where, where the losses are and where the chip is and where all the vibrations are coming from, why don't I actually just avoid it and just make this this vibration kind of go in the loop uh, around this around this around the edge of it? 
Um, and that was really fascinating because that was just something, uh, you know, none of us thought about. Um, and actually, apparently, if you look at how spider webs really work, um, one of the ways that it detects is actually by detecting these lateral motions um, in a spider web. So it's, it's, it's kind of weird because it's it, without giving it any kind of background about, you know, how a spider web works, what it does, it was already kind of finding the ways that spider webs actually do work in nature. Um, and, but, but essentially um, retrofitting it for our, for our kind of high vacuum systems. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. We have a couple of questions here. When you mention the machine learning here or the, your collaborator to find something special about the structure, what do you mean about special? For example, you mentioned the circular motion and instead of going dampening this, um, the weight, the damping. But can I just what was special? Can you break it down more in detail? Um, yeah, how you figure out what's special about the structure? For example, this number of stages is like two, three, four, the, the dimension. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so, so essentially, what did we learn from this? Like it gave us this very simplified design and trying to figure out why did it do this? And, right, and, and, um, and so that's actually, I would say, the really interesting part because um, a lot of the times you think about machine learning as being this thing where it gives you a design and then you go, okay, great, I'll just take that design and use it. But what, what I actually found a lot and, and, um, was that it, it's actually quite a bit of an of a interplay between our intuition and the, and, the, and the machine learning. It would show you a design and you'd go, oh, uh, let me figure out why you're doing that. And you'd, and you'd look at it and you'd go, oh, okay, that's interesting. You're doing that because, so for instance, what it wanted to do, the reason it shows uh, the minimum amount of radial lines is because it really wanted to make the, the lateral lines connecting them as long as possible. Um, and that essentially gives, so essentially gives you a really high Q factor to be able to make those as long as possible. If you had made many radial lines, it would have broken up this, the, this motion into really small little segments, which would have made a lot of bending points where, where uh, there's a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of heating that happens and a lot of uh, mechanical loss that happens. So, so what it was trying to do was essentially trying to minimize the amount of points at which it was kind of twisting uh, the, this motion. And so when we looked at that, we thought, oh, that's, that's interesting. So now, um, but you have to play a little detective because you look at the device and you have to figure out, okay, why is it doing this? And then kind of based on that intuition, maybe you redirect the machine learning algorithm in a little bit different way based on the new intuition that it's just shown you. Um, so and it's so it's kind of this weird back and forth until you get to a to a to a place uh, that that that's really nice. So um, it's a really good question because I, I do think that that that's a big that's something that we do ask ourselves is why is it doing this and what is so special about this the seemingly very simple design that it that it's made. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So maybe I'm curious to ask you: Do you think what other configuration or architecture? that you think may be beyond the spider web. And I want to ask you the question because I find it fascinating, the relation between the material and architecture. And maybe that's my opinion. I find that sometimes in, in soft robotics, for example, the material part is interesting, but the architecture and how you can play with material in different configuration is also very interesting. It leads sometimes something fascinating behavior when you play with the architecture. And for your experience, when you try the design of spider web, do you think there was something challenging for material. You said already say that you're using silicon nitride, but is there any differences here? Do you think when you play with architecture and material, do you think there's something between them that should be considered, or there's no concern for you at all between architecture and yeah, material? Yeah, I mean, one one of the things that made me even think about spider webs to begin with, um, as an architecture, right? Yeah, they're 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 a vibrational sensor, right? And that's easy to say, um, but you know, there's also vibrational sense. There's, you know, also moths, for instance, have very good hearing, like some of the best hearing, which is also a vibrational sensor. So why not try a moth, uh, try to model it after a moth ear, for instance, which has some of the best hearing in the animal kingdom. Um, also been 
uh, evolution, you know, uh, developed over over millions of years with evolution. Um, but one of the things that makes spider spider webs quite interesting is that if you look at them, they're actually also some of the most high aspect ratio uh, natural structures that you see anywhere. Um, you know, these are things that um, have have threads that are microns uh, microns wide, but then are suspended over over really centimeter scales and sometimes even meter scales. There are some like brown spider species that that make these webs over meters with with little strings that are microns in size. Um, and, and that's and that's actually quite I, I think maybe maybe something that um, I started to appreciate um, really much later in my career is, is is looking at that and saying, you know, if we made that in a in a in a foundry, that would actually be quite impressive to make something like that that's freestanding and that can take the wind and, you know, can take all these really big forces like a big prey, you know, falling onto it and not breaking. Um, so, so one of the reasons we chose spider webs is, is because they have this high aspect ratio element to them, which makes it very similar to these high aspect ratio structures we make in silicon nitride. Um, and this high stress is a really big part of that, you know, in the material aspect, because if you have some kind of, you know, floppy material, uh, you're not going to make very high aspect ratio structures because they won't be nice and taut and, you know, be able to make them straight on a microchip or a, or a silicon wafer. So, so that's kind of how, well, why we started looking at, at, at spider webs. And it's not just that they're vibrational sensors and that, you know, they're, they're pretty cool that we, you know, you see them kind of everywhere, but it's also that they do have in, in, in their structure, in terms of being a high aspect ratio structure, it, it is quite similar in that sense. And they actually do end up having kind of similar aspect ratios, you know, um, if you look at a spider web, it's some, the, the tethers are microns or tens of microns wide, and they go up to centimeters or decimeter scales. Um, if you look at the, at the, uh, silicon nitride structures, they're more on the nanometer scale, nanometer thick tethers. Um, and, but they only go up to millimeter scales. That's usually what people have been able to make at this stage that are freestanding. So, but they are, but they are similar aspect ratios. So that, I think that, I think it does make. There is a really intimate connection between the material that you use, the 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 architecture, the structure, and the design. Mm -hmm. Great. Maybe a quick question because in the paper you already an inspiration already from the orbit web spider, and there's other types of the web design by spider. Did you think that also that something would be interesting to consider the other designs by spider web because it's not all the spider webs are the same structure. Did you consider that as well? Yeah, so we, I, I actually, we, we did look at, um, for instance, an evolution table because there is actually quite a lot of different spiders um, and different types of, but we basically chose the, one of the most successful ones and kind of also one of the mo more well-known ones, which is this orb web spider, uh, spider webs, which is, yeah, again, this kind of this Halloween kind of way, but yeah, it, it's, it's true. There are really a lot of different types of of, of structures, but we kind of just went with maybe the, I would say one that was the more the more simple one, just to see kind of what we could do with that. And I guess the results for us were already so surprisingly good that we that we haven't gone past that. But it but it definitely could be an idea to even look at these other types of of uh, um, spiderweb structures and just trying to see whether they could bring something new to the table. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you if the sensor, for example, has a failure. And one of the things that was really interesting that spider web design, if they have damage in a certain part, still have this redundancy and the structure all itself. And I'm curious to ask you, do you think there's other maybe feature or interesting maybe consideration about the design besides the, the, the first application, but do you think there's other interesting functionality you can get of the design of the spider web? for sensor yeah um it's we i yeah so what we've been looking at now is wondering whether can we use this for instance um for making break uh breakage so for instance um uh, sensors that are resilient to breakage 
so if you look at spider webs and how they're made, um, one of the things that's very interesting about that, and again, I, you know, it's hard to say for anyone really to say that they know how they work because they're they're really complicated structures. But one of the things that they're made that they're made very well for is is um, essentially um, a lot of times what happens with spider webs is that things will kind of fall into them, say a, a fly or a really big prey falls really fast into them and breaks parts of it, right? And, and one of the things that the spider web still needs to be able to do is still be able to sense even when there's p large parts of it missing. Uh, and, so, and so I think that that's actually quite interesting, for instance, if you want to make sensors in very... Um, uh, kind of volatile environments where maybe parts of it could fall off or could be damaged and you still want the sensor to work very well. Um, so, so what we've now been thinking about is can we maybe learn something about how to design a sensor that could, that could be broken and not replaced, um, for instance, uh, many times because these are expensive chips to, to make. Uh, so can we make something like that that is resilient to breakage um, where it can still function really well. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you, since you mentioned the architecture beside the material, and for example, literature, the common example, the square lattice, if you have the square lattice to sense a certain point, what do you think the advantages when we go to from linear architecture to something like the spider and have this ring, and as you highlighted at the beginning, what do you think may be special from the nonlinear geometry when you go from square lattice to something like spider web, for example, and the design. Yeah, and I think I think what I would say what what really surprised us is that um, if you look and I'll just and I'll just um, so you know if you look at 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 how um, if you look at how every every other sensor worked before with this platform, what they tried to do is they tried to look at you know, some up and down motion of their vibrating element. And then they tried to engineer how this up and down motion was engineered as it went from the center over to the edge. And they just basically thought about the, the you know, the, the X, Y motion of it. You know, what does mode look like um, if you took like a, like a cut view through it? You know, they just try to see what does this mode look like? And now how do I try to reduce these, this bending, this bending losses uh, just by engineering the way this mode bends as it goes towards towards the outside, where it's clamped. Um, what what this machine learning algorithm did was it figured out um, a, a mechanical mode, which didn't just look at the mode and how it kind of went up and down in X and Y and what the mode shape looked like in X and Y. It started considering essentially so what you saw is it looked something like something that, that was twisting at the at the at the joints so it was starting to consider these weird um, kind of paradigms that we didn't really think about before like just simply how do we make something that twists instead of just going up and down but something that uh, just goes up and down but also has kind of a twisting motion that's kind of manipulated in, in 2d um, and I think that's what was, was something that, that really surprises and made it special was that it started to kind of figure out um, how to make this vibration isolation using torsion, um, which is something that just hadn't been done before with, with other designs um, in, in this kind of category of, of, of platforms. Of course, there's, there's many torsional uh, sensors, um, but in this category of sensors, people had this, this kind of very strict idea of how did how do you design these these sensors mm -hmm. to be really good and state of the art. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you since you mentioned uh, something interesting, the intuition and why the machine is designing what you design, and the, maybe the generative design. What other possibilities do you think? When do you think about the current design for your intuition? Do you think there's something maybe beyond this design can be more interesting, or you still think? That's maybe the the ideal or maybe optimum design. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm curious about your intuition also in that design space. That maybe we can push beyond that, or maybe there's limitation you found. I'm I'm, I'm curious if there's something was interesting uh, in the web-inspired sensor. Maybe limitation or shortage in the design. 
that led you think maybe there's something here missing or maybe I can push again in the design of the sensor? Yeah, um, what I would say is that I think the machine learning algorithm, again, doesn't know this physics, doesn't know the science really. It, um, and, and I think that it's only as interesting, um, it, in some ways it's only as interesting as as the um, as the parameter space that you give it, right? Because and 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 what you want. Because remember, you I think you were saying asking me before, like, oh, how do you how do you know which thing to pick for? Because there's a lot of different uh, aspects to a sensor. You know, there's the there's the measurement time, there's the size, there's um, uh, maybe the Allen deviation. How much does the frequency shift? You know, these kind of things the uh, the dynamic range there's a lot of different parts of a sensor and and I think that one of the interesting parts is is trying to figure out which one is important so for instance in in the in, in our case we knew that the the footprint of this uh, the footprint of our sensor was something that was very important because one of the things that uh, that we wanted was we wanted a small sensor, right? And that's just an intuition we have as 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 experimentalists that we want a small sensor, and there's a lot of reasons for that. It's it's partly that you want to be able to fit a lot of sensors in one chip, but it's also a heating issue, right? If you have something that's a really high aspect ratio structure, then when I point a laser at it and try to do measurements on it, there's going to be just a little bit of absorption that goes in there, and it's going to start to heat the structure. That, 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 that'll kind of affect how it works. So in that sense, you do want it to be small so that it can dissipate, the, dissipate that heat very quickly. Um, uh, so, so one of the parameters we gave it was that we wanted it to have a small, small, small footprint and the machine learning algorithm essentially worked with that and said, okay, yeah, okay, this is, we have a small footprint. I can't go beyond that. So let me just start making things that some, some structures that vibrate around <laughs> The, the edge because I can't actually extend past the edge, right? Um, and so I do think that that there is a kind of very interesting part about knowing and giving it different um, targets that that you know are interesting from your from your uh, intuition as a, you know uh, um, uh, as a as a scientist. Um, so, so maybe to answer your question about, you know, where do you go from there? I, I think part of it is, 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 you know, can we, for instance, have a spider web sensor that we wanted to measure accelerations instead of forces, for instance, or we wanted to measure pressures, or we wanted to measure something else, um, or we want it to be smaller, or we want it to have a, a frequency that doesn't vary so much and those are all going to be things that have that are things you want but you have to figure out for which application which ones are more important for you and which ones are less important and 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 I think that the cool thing is that I think depending on how you how you input the importance and the weighting of those of those different aspects the machine learning algorithm can give you something different even with the same base design so I so I think that that's that's maybe I don't know if that answers your question um, maybe quick, yeah. Maybe a quick question: the resolution. Can you tell us more about the resolution scale, uh, the and how you think the relationship with the architecture, if you would like make smaller, more precise in the scale of the resolution with the architecture? Which one was maybe, I don't know the the scale of the design, the architecture. How the correlationship between the scale of sensing and the architecture? Uh, you mean like the, the the scale or the size of the individual yes, parts? Yes, and the sensing and sensing scale, like nano four. I don't know. Just I'm curious about that. Yeah. Right. Um, so one of the things that uh, we wanted to to. So one of the things that if you if you look at a lot of this if you look at a lot of the state of the art uh, uh, literature. Is that um, to get these really high to get these really um, kind of state of the art performance? You always have to go to these really sub micron features. You have to go to sub micron features. You have to make these tethers that were, you know, two hundred nanometers, one hundred nanometers wide. 
um, which really requires special types of lithography, and they're expensive, and they're difficult to, to fabricate, and they take quite a lot of expertise to, to get them right. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was say, look, why don't we try to just give it a limitation that it can't make many of the tethers, you know, small, uh, smaller than a micron. They have to be micron sized tethers um, uh, because we think that that will make it much more easily uh, usable, for instance, with photolithography, where you can make, you know, many, many devices all at once instead of. Uh, uh, electron lithogra lithography, which is expensive and really writes one at a time. Um, uh, so, so we gave it that limitation, and that was more of a manufacturing limitation. So that's, this also comes back to the inputs that we give it. So we, we were thinking about the manufacturing a lot because we wanted to make it something that was easy, easy to manufacture. So we gave that as a parameter space that the, that the machine learning can work with, and it said, okay, well, I can't make anything smaller than a micron, so how am I going to do this? And it started to make these nice designs. Um, so I, I, I do think um, that, that for us, the manufacturing was really something that was quite important in terms of an input for, 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 for how we design these things. Um, and and uh, yeah, I, and I think also experimentally, it was also something that was good for us because when you start to make things that are really 200 nanometers wide, 100 nanometers wide, you will have yield issues. And that's something that is a realistic thing in, 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 you know, in any kind of nanotechnology. You have to think about yield. And for us, because they are high aspect ratio structures, we don't have a lot of room to have, to have you know, 80% of these things breaking. Uh, <laughs> So, um, so for us, that was partly something about it being easy to use, but also experimentally for us, it, it made it easy to be able to have many samples because a lot of these take time to make. Um, it's a data, it's a, it's a scarce, uh, what's it called? It's, um, it's an experimentally scarce problem. <laughs> so, you know, so each one takes really some time to make, to measure, um, and these kind of things. How do you think about integration different material as a sensors like the sensor like different measurement in the spider web architecture since the traditional one we use for example is just like square lattice design and you integrate the material different material to sense different uh, different characteristics so for you do you think it's it would be make difference to integrate two material in a spider web design I don't know if you oh, like to, to have more materials involved in the... To in sense, the, yeah, sense, yeah. Yeah, it, it could be possible. Um, I definitely think that it would be interesting, for instance, to include superconducting materials for a lot of superconducting applications. So there's a lot of, there's a really large community of, of people that are doing microwave sensors uh, that use, uh, they use these, they want to have these high stress films, but they also want some superconducting aspect to it. Um, and I do think that that is actually something that would be very interesting because uh, you could tell the machine learning algorithm, for instance, look, now we have two materials. This one is a little bit, is a lot lossier than this other high stress one. Can you figure out how to distribute it? Um, and, and so that would be something very interesting, I think, um, for future applications. Um, and maybe also, and I actually forgot to say this, but it's something about your last questions about the designs and where to go from here. Because I also think that, you know, we started off with this base design that kind of came from our intuition of, you know, nature and looking at these things. And, but I also think that w one of the things that we're excited about is actually having the machine learning algorithm come up with its own base model. Um, so there's a lot, so there's a big community of people doing now inverse design or topology optimization of, of a lot of, structures and so now you're seeing quite a bit of of, of these two fields merging uh, much more as the topology optimization sides and the, and these uh, you know machine learning sides and trying to see if there's a way that we can even not even think about the structure ourselves but have the machine learning algorithm think about it itself for for whatever different application you have or whatever um, uh, elements that you want in your sensor I want to ask you what other may be interesting or maybe not answer question yet in the design space of the sensor, how to design sensor. Do you think still this question 
not really fully answered or you still don't understand this aspect of the sensor design. Still very challenging. There's material, architecture, manufacturing, and when you look, there's other aspects you think is still challenging for sensor, if we boost the sensor capabilities, or I'm just curious what other aspect you think still not answered or other question, yeah. Um, I would say that, um, hmm, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I would say, I would say actually one of the things that for us would be, is still really interesting is, is, is actually this question you have of different materials, because right now what we did was we just kind of went with the state of the art. Let's just go with the material that everyone's using to make these state of the art devices. Um, and one thing that we're really curious about is if we switch to different materials, will, and you give it different loss mechanisms, different Young's modulus, different uh, strains, densities, will the machine learning algorithm make a fundamentally different design decision based on the different, and we haven't tried that yet. We just really went for what we know works well in this, in this regime. But one thing that we are interested in a lot is figuring out if we put a different uh, uh, material, for instance, will the, will the machine learning algorithm make something similar or will it just say, oh, you know, well, if the density is like this, well, we should really completely redesign this whole thing and, and make it do this uh, kind of vibration or, or just design it in a completely different way. So I would say that's, that's something that we're, that we're really quite interested in. Mm -hmm. So two questions left. The first one, since you already work in the commercial part, and I'm curious when you work in academia and the commercial part, what are maybe the key point to have this vision that maybe that something could be commercialized. Because sometimes in academia, if something works once time, it's challenging and you publish it. But for you, because you have this two aspects, what maybe differentiates the commercial part that you already have also an academic part? Or there's no difference from your experience? Yeah. Um, well, what, what I would say is, is one thing that I have found that, it's, that is similar um, is the need to have, um, to have devices and designs that do consider the manufacturing because, and, and that's important for both because in academia, in, 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 in commercial sensors, if you're going to a foundry and you have these designs or these, um, sensors that really have a yield that's really small, let's say 10% and they, you know, 10% of them make it. And of those 10%, Maybe ten percent of those really work at at the performance level that you you have touted them to work at, right? Um, the that's not going to be a sensor that anyone wants to make, that anyone wants to produce or try to commercialize. Um, it's just very difficult um, because there's just that bottleneck. If you look at academia, I think that you know there is a bottleneck in terms of time. You know, you don't, if you have the, you know, 10% of them that are making it towards the end and 10% of them that work the way they should work, then these experiments are going to take forever to take, to, to do. So I do see that there is a similarity in, in a need for that, for that considering the manufacturing and the design and the structure and all of these things very intimately together, because I do think they limit both, but in different ways. Um, uh, so for academia, it's less about, uh, I, I would say for commercial sensing, it's more really about the cost. I think for academia, it's really more about the timing, um, in some ways, but I guess they're both, you know, many, many people would say that they're, those things are equivalent. Uh, um, but what do I see as the difference between them is, is I do think that, that that for academia, you for and for a lot of these kind of academic, uh, more academic, you know, um, pursuits where you're really talking about, for instance, wanting to observe really exotic quantum behavior and these uh, for the first time in these really massive objects that are in room temperature environments, um, or, or trying to measure gravity in a very different way. Um, there, you really you really, your parameter space is actually somewhat bigger because you don't really, 
care how e how how much space it takes up. You don't care so much how much um, uh, you, you don't care how how easy it is to integrate with a measurement system. Uh, you know, for instance, you know you don't care that it's plug and play, right? It can be a really complicated optical optical table of of equipment, and it as long as you as long as you observe that 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 really important result that you want to you know observe, it's fine. And, and but but then you should design you should as as your design input as your design parameter space that should really change uh, that you put into your algorithm. You say, hey, look, I don't care about any of these things. I just care that it really works and that I can show it. For a commercial sensor, it's very different. I, there, I would, for instance, care about the stability of it over a long time. I would care about the resilience to vibrations or to to environmental. Um, kind of like volatile environments uh, because you really do have something that's being picked up and taken around on a plane or on a train. Um, you you, you want to consider designs that are smaller so that we can pack many of these because, you know, we want an array of them to 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 measure large uh, areas, for instance. So I, I, I do think that there's just there's just a different parameter space of things that you care about. But I think that's kind of one of the things that excites me about this kind of uh, data scarce um, um, machine learning that uh, my colleagues have been working on is that uh, it allows you to really think about what you want and then input it and then really start to get results in a very quick, timely manner uh, so that you can really design for those things and try to pick which one you want. Last question, what makes you fulfilled and satisfied? Yeah, I would say this this project is an incredibly good example of that, actually, because um, you know, I, I for the past two years, I've essentially been working with uh, machine learning experts, um, and in that sense, for me, this kind of collaborative uh, work environment has been incredibly, uh, yeah, engaging, fun, um, just really fulfilling because I just come in and I learn something new. Um, when you think about this, you know, machine learning people and nanotechnology people coming together, you, you think that it's kind of a quick, yeah, you know, just put this into your thing and yeah, give me a design. Um, it's not really that, that easy. It actually took us, I would say, somewhere around, around half a year to really start to speak the same language, you know, for, you know, to really, really speak the same, the same language, um, uh, in, in terms of his machine learning language and my nanomechanics language. Um, and so I actually found that to be, uh, yeah, really enriching. And, and I, I think for me, that's actually something that, you know, I'm still, it, it, it really gets me to learn a lot, a lot more than maybe I normally would, I would say. Uh, so I actually find this kind of uh, collaboration just, yeah, in, incredibly fun. Um, and I, I would say this is what brings me joy uh, in researching.